Hi, I'm from Eugene Robot. Um, I introduced myself earlier. My name's Daniel Stonia. I've been at Eugene for about uh, six years now. So about four years longer than I planned. Um, but things come up, like marriages and kids. Uh, one marriage, sorry. Um, <laughs> So when asked to, to give a talk, of course, the first thing you want to talk about is the thing that you really love, your, your, your best passion. But being stuck in a company, you can't talk about some things. Um, so I can't talk about C -slam, uh, vision navigation or anything like that. But on the, on the flip side, your company gives you a chance to work on something exciting like that. So you kind of have to balance things sometimes. And then uh, Brian suggested talk, doing a talk about service robotics in a, in a company using ROS. Uh, but I think we had a couple of other people here talking about that today. Paul I talked about how they adapted to their raw systems and we've seen some other conversations the the guys in in japan also adapted their previous stuff across to ross as well and we ported our robots across to ross about three years ago um, and uh, we've uh, end of lined a couple of lines the the other ones uh, is a cleaning robot which we're still working on um, but we'll probably be much more interesting talking about that next year uh, so i decided to do something a bit different and uh, talk about some of the software that's out there that, that most of us robot developers don't sort of really get in touch with much. Um, and you have to know a little bit about them because you end up having to give your robots to users or consumers or clients and you have to work out which technology you want to use and what resources you've got and how to connect them with your, your devs, your dev team and the, the users at the other end. So to start with, Um, just in terms of being able to set up graphical environments for your users, we've got three primary choices in the ROS ecosystem. Uh, RQT, um, the Java Android libraries, and web tools. I'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. Um, we use all three. Uh, and sometimes that seems like a bit of work, sort of using all three at the same time. But they each have their place. RQT is the, the new graphical framework for ROS. They they moved across from WX widgets a couple of years ago. Uh, so it forms the, uh, the official tools that ROS comes out with. Uh, and they're great dev tools. And it's really easy to write RQT plugins uh, for your own systems. Uh, they're, they're great for development. They're great for running at the factory. Um, they're great for just whipping something up quickly and showing your CTO. Uh, they've got the potential, being QT, to be cross-platform. Um, but I, I don't think we've got the critical mass. I get asked a lot, can you move these programs across to Windows? And uh, there's a lot of like small things. We, we do our Qt program generally in Python these days, and so there's a lot of small bugs that need to be fixed to, to make it actually work on, a on another platform. Um, but I don't think that's going to come anytime soon. So it's pretty much a, a Linux-based environment for your graphical environments. Java Android, this one, when this first came out, it was being worked on by a couple of guys at Google, Damon Collar in particular. Um, there was a lot of excitement really early on, uh, but I think that was very quickly followed by a lot of frustration. Um, that was going back about three years ago, maybe more. Um, using it was actually very difficult. It wasn't because it was a hard set of API to use. It was just not convenient. Uh, you couldn't dump it on your system with the rest of your ROS packages and, and use it natively. You couldn't even do it in a regular Java environment very easily. Um, it wasn't packaged and released, so every time you sort of got it working, it moved. And uh, you had to really chase and chase and chase. And we tried using the, the Java particularly for, for two reasons. One was to connect with other user groups which have Java ecosystems already. And another one was to build Android programs. And we tried, I think, three times. I gave it to my devs to try, and it, it, we failed, failed, failed. And so we give it up, and we try something else. And then eventually last year, came back and decided, OK, Damon's doing a really great job of writing the libraries for this. Um, I'll just sort of work out how to package it for him. And so for Hydro, we, we did a little bit of work packaging it. Uh, we, we took a couple of important things. One was to be able to provide two convenient working environments. Uh, one was in a ROS workspace where someone like me could pick it up, dump it alongside my Python and C++ programs and just compile. 
And the other one was to be able to provide uh, jars in like an AppGet repository. Uh, in the Java world, it's a, a Maven repository. So someone can build their Java programs without needing to install ROS at all. They can just connect to the Maven repository, pick up the, the ROS Java jars, and they're away. Um, we had success with that. We got that working. There's a Maven repository up on GitHub now. Um, we've got the cat can make uh, semi-integrated with the Java Gradle under the hood. So you can build that with cat can make on your workspace. Um, the only thing that's still a little bit awkward is the message generation. Uh, we'll tackle that coming up to Indigo, so we'll probably work on that in about a month or two. Um, and the other really big step was Android. Uh, previously, Android, you had to build with Eclipse. Uh, it didn't work. That You could build it on the command line as well, but there was no integration between uh, building it with Eclipse and building it on the command line. Uh, you couldn't manage Android libraries in the way that we all do with libraries in a ROS workspace. So it was very awkward to manage and maintain. You couldn't do any continuous integration. Uh, recently, this was about a year ago, uh, Google changed direction. They shifted to Android Studio and Gradle. And uh, Gradle is kind of like your, if you're not familiar with it, it's like CMake for Java. Um, and I it's fully integrated. So if you do Gradle on the command line, it syncs exactly with what Android Studio is doing in the graphical development environment. It just uses Gradle under the hood. Uh, it means you can do continuous integration. It means you can package very easily. It means you can uh, roll out a complete suite of libraries. Uh, Google put out their specs for .aars, which are like jar files, but for Android. So you can now store your .ar files in a Maven repository. Um, so we can now link to the Maven repository, just build a single Android app and utilize half a dozen libraries we've already got built for Android up there. Um, makes the, the development much easier than it was two or three years ago. So hopefully it's working for us. I can now give this to my, my dev team and they don't have to have any experience and now they can actually program Java and program Android. Uh, that was after two or three failures over three years. And of course, the other one is web tools, which is probably the future. Um, it's uh, got a, a, a getting a, quite a bit of momentum now, I think. It's also uh, getting managed pretty well by Russell Torres, and, give, and that gives it some direction. That's always very important with an open source project that you've got someone up top really managing where it's going. Um, we have a, a young guy who's, who's mad about web apps, so kind of give him a bit of free reign with web tools. I, I think with your devs, it's very important if they got some passion for something, and they have a few basic skills, let them go in that direction. Um, it may not be completely compatible with what you're doing, but as long as it's 80% compatible, you get a lot more out of those guys than you would if you pushed them in another direction. Um, so this is uh, the advantage, of course, is it's very cross-platform, and you can embed in other web services. Uh, the, the, the disadvantage is you can't access a device or a PC for like file system handling or anything like that. I'll skip this because I don't think we'll have time to go into detail. Just as a comparison with our experience, uh, we had, well, the, the guys had quite a few fights about what kind of tools we should build or what we should put our effort into. It wasn't really clear when we started looking at this. Um, th in the end, uh, what we do is, for our dev tools and our factory tools, we just quickly rip them up in Q RQT. Um, that's the easiest way to get something going. And also when our API is unstable and always changing, um, or if we're prototyping a new user interface, we'll do that in RQT as well, because it's very easy to manage a changing API within your same Catkin workspace. On the flip side, if you, you try and do that on a volatile subset in Android or web apps, it means you always have to keep going and, and updating those packages on as well, which can get, it's like three times the work then. So once our API becomes stable, we then shift it over and uh, move to either Android or web apps. For the most part, we use web apps. Um, we use the Android when we're uh, doing things like having to connect with the, the device. Uh, so the main one at the moment that we use is NFC. So we can just go uh, click the phone on the robot and uh, it will automatically start the app that we want to run. Um, I'll talk about those apps a little bit more later. At the next level, this is uh, still talking about robots. Um, how we kind of, it, ROS is a very freeform uh, 
set of software. You can do pretty much anything you like with it, which is actually one of its strengths. It's very easy to get into because you can just write something simple without having to worry about conforming to the high specifications of a particular component model. But sometimes that's a little bit frustrating trying to scale up and uh, do something more. Uh, so OSRF has been working on something called capabilities um, over the last year or so, and I think William's shaping up to do a release in the next month or two. Uh, there's, they've been working, oh, I'll talk about that a bit more. Uh, on top of capabilities, um, we do kind of like, because we're a business company and we are often uh, doing services for clients or customers, uh, we like to sort of like have a layer which we can easily start, stop a task, bring down a whole environment because we're not working with uh, i7 Intel computers, uh, usually working with very low-spec computers, so you want to tear down the whole environment, bring it up differently for a different task. Um, so we have a, a robot app manager which takes care of that. And for connecting to your robot, uh, like we don't want to We keep having to explain to someone how to go into an SSH tunnel, how to uh, ROS launch something or how to ROS run something. So uh, we've been looking for an easier way to manage that so we don't spend so much time talking to our customers. So capabilities, I, I don't have any picture here, sorry. I tried to get one at the last minute, but it was too late. Um, basically, if you start with the question, I, I need navigation. Uh, navigation is a good example for this. Uh, we've got the Navi stack, and people understand this is like a, a good box. It's a good set of software which does something. Okay, what does it do? You have to then go hopefully find some documentation on the ROS wiki to figure out what ROS API is. There's no way of actually really introspecting that, um, either in a... Y you might get lucky and find something in an REP, um, but generally it's it's a very unstructured ROS wiki document you have to go to. Uh, you can't introspect at runtime. Uh, what if you're... Uh, when you want to launch it, uh, you usually have to specify a configuration for a particular navigation stack um, in your ROS launch file. So your application then needs a different launcher for every robot you put it onto. So if you want to be portable, you just want to say, I want navigation. It's not, I want navigation with this particular configuration. Or uh, we were often swapping between Stargazer-based navigation and a ROS laser-based Navi stack, but the API was the same. The application doesn't really care, but we had to write extra ROS launchers across the top all over the place. Um, so capabilities is a way to kind of structure that. Uh, William's been working on that. Uh, he's got good input from, from Ferg's at Unbounded Robotics, uh, Mike at Clearpath, and from Marcus at Eugen in developing this. Um, and it consists of the idea of providing some of this uh, interface specification that a, a more fully uh, component model-based uh, middleware does, um, but without having to make it compulsory in ROS. Uh, so there is a, a, a standard capability interface for a particular thing. It might be like an image uh, provider or it might be a diff drive system. And on the robot, you actually so you have an interface specification. On the robot, you write an implementation of that specification. Then you might have multiple implementations of that specification on a particular robot. And you have a server which scans what's on your system and uh, tells you uh, what you can run. So your application says, hey, I need navigation. And it can say, I've got these kinds of navigation. Which one do you want? Um, it can start, stop some. It watchdogs them. You can remap the ROS API. So if you don't want your command velocity in slash command vel, and you want to mux it, you can put it somewhere else. Uh, it handles semantic capabilities, so you can have a front camera, you can have a rear camera, you can have a head camera. Um, it can handle dependencies from, it's got a dependency tree for your capability. So at the lowest level, you can have a diff drive capability. Above that, you can have a navigation capability. Uh, so it's not so important for research labs, but uh, for a product, I think uh, that's kind of a, a nice uh, bit of structure we can put in the robot to enable us to scale on top a little bit faster. Application Manager, we actually run this on top of the capability layer. This here is your capability layer. And uh, that's just a way of writing a, a, an app which represents a task on the robot that we can tear down and we can bring up. So y y the bootstrap layer would be your really basic drivers to your motors and things like that. And above that, you want to bring down all of that software, which is very expensive, reconfigure it, bring it up again without having to interrupt your whole raw system. And we also use it at a higher level to expose what the robot can do. So 
Uh, we don't provide any access to what's inside. We only provide access to what the, the apps provide. Um, interactions, this is, at the moment, merely it's a way of just uh, conveniently uh, setting up your, you have a ROS robot, for instance, okay, and, and what does it provide? Okay, where's the documentation? Uh, what ROS launches can I run? Um, what ROS runs can I run? What, what web apps can I run? Uh, usually you have to go look everywhere to figure out that information. So the interactions module, it uh, runs a server on your robot, and we have a, we call it a remote con. It's a piece of software which can connect to that server, and usually we, we either use NFC or we use uh, auto discovery to find that server, or you can just plug in the IP. Once it finds that server, it says, hey, what applications are there? And so it will return with a list of applications which can run on this robot. Um, they can just be links to URLs. They can be web apps, web app URLs. You can parameterize and, and remap the configuration for these applications. So in this case here, you probably can't see it very well, but you have, it, it starts with an interface where you can see the list of robots that you want to connect to. You, you jump in, it can ask you for a role, are you an admin or user, That's, it's just a convenience candy mostly. And then you get down to, it gives you a list of apps. And so in the background you can see one of the RQT graph-like apps. So it, if you're giving out a robot to a customer, um, you actually need very little documentation then. Everything is in the robot. And they can just point either an RQT remote con or we also have an Android remote con at the robot, and bam, all the information is there. Going up a bit, um, this is something we've been doing specifically. We've been looking at uh, how to uh, do multi-robot human device environments. So we want to expand what we do outside of the robot to take in a whole service. And how, how we can do that faster. It's not trivial with something like ROS. It's not trivial with robots. Um, so the, the big focus is on making this easy, making this simpler. Uh, so we developed a couple of tools to get there. The gateways are, are a way to send communications from one master to another. Um, on top of that, last year we started looking at the question of orchestration. H how do you orchestrate your multi-robots in an effective way? Um, and then recently we've been trying to get Gazebo hooked up. So one of the problems with doing multi-robots with Gazebo is you can't take, you have to sort of structure your multiple robots in Gazebo and you can't transfer that immediately to your multiple robots. Um, so we've been looking at how doing it using multi-master techniques. So the software you have running on the, the multi-master gazebo goes straight to your robots. So the gateways are, we, we set up a gateway on each robot. Um, and on the network you can have one or more hubs. And the hubs are just a Redis server. Uh, we, we generally auto-discover the hubs and uh, we send information from one gateway to the next across these hubs. And at the moment that information is being used to flip a topic, so you might have a, a publisher on your robot, you want to flip that across to a centralized workspace. Um, so you send that information to the hub, and then that gets directed to exactly the ROS master you want it to go to. On the opposite, uh, in the opposite direction, you can advertise something you want. So if you, you want to make a service available, like a web service, you advertise it, anybody can pull that one into its own master. So in this case, it's still peer-to-peer, -peer. Um, like a publisher, when it flips, you basically take the XML RPC URI, you register that on the other master. And that's working at the moment with uh, pub, subs, actions, and services. Um, the one thing we want to do with this, oh, this year we implemented some robust wireless handling in it, so if the connection dropped, um, it would recognize that and, and let you know. And when the connection came back, it would re-register all of the connections. Um, the next thing we want to do is to be able to provide some configuration so that you can customize how you want to do this. So instead of sending the, the publisher directly, drop in a relay, um, we want to write for ROS 2.0, but I think we're going to have to move a little bit faster for our own purposes and drop in something like a relay where you can actually customize some nice uh, quality processes on your, your wireless link. Um, orchestration was an interesting question this year. I, Within this project, this is a, a government project that we're involved in with uh, OSF is working with us, uh, Austin University in Texas is working with us, and a few Korean groups are working with us as well. And uh, everybody has his own idea on what to do for orchestration. Um, and I wasn't going to make anyone happy by doing anything. <laughs> 
So decided to say to everyone, look, I, I don't care what you want to do. The most important thing is, uh, obviously, there is no right solution right now. Um, it's something we need to explore. Uh, and for the groups that are exploring this space, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that's needed, which is why a lot of research probably doesn't get done. Uh, they have to build all of these connections around the orchestration, uh, build up the software interfaces which can work with whatever orchestration they're doing. So we decided to forget about the orchestration problem and just provide them independent blocks and where they can do their own orchestration. We provide an API for grabbing your resources, whether that's a robot, or whether it's a device, um, starting a task on those resources which, which can interact with you. Um, another library which will provide a, a, like a software farm where you can run shared services across the lot uh, and running an interactions manager so that each, each independent block can tell the interactions manager, hey, I can run these programs, connect to me like this. Um, and the basic infrastructure is in place uh, and me being a ROS guy, I tend to write my independent blocks in ROS. Uh, the Korean groups we're working with, they're writing something with a, a business process. Uh, Austin University is doing something with a, a new scripted language for orchestrating robots that they want to experiment with. So that seems to be uh, finding its own good direction, directionless direction. Now the last thing we did uh, a couple of months ago with Austin was um, like doing multiple robots, it's painful debugging. It's painful debugging a single ROS robot, uh, let alone multiple robots where the, the number of things that can go wrong just explode. So we wanted to do it in Gazebo and we wanted to make it so that we could just take the software directly and put them on the real robots without having to change it for Gazebo. And uh, using the gateways and, and using the concert orchestration, we, we can do this now. We proof of concepted it last September and then uh, Austin at Pusch got this all running in, in a way so that we run a gazebo service as one of those independent blocks and we can ask that gazebo service, hey, start me a total bot, or in this case, hey, start me a seg bot, which is what Austin's using. And uh, it will fire up. So we have the, the concert running here and we have fired up two independent seg bots on their own ROS masters. And you can run your service, your, your orchestration services on top and then transfer that directly to a robot. Uh, and that seems to work pretty well, so we'll keep going in that direction. And the last thing I want to talk about, yeah, how much time? Quick. Okay, is uh, uh, being based in Korea um, it, and being a conference in Asia, uh, probably interesting to talk about some of the challenges we have with with getting Ross into Korea. Um, I think Kai Okada mentioned uh, an interesting comment. He said, seems like they're only active, but mostly they're very quiet, but yet there's still really a lot of interest in ROS. And I think uh, Korea is a little bit the same. There's an awful amount of interest in ROS. Um, but Koreans are, are one generally very shy, very nice, uh, and they don't come out very loudly. Uh, but we're having a couple of groups who are actually taking the dive uh, in the last year or so. And one of the groups is Etri, who are also co-sponsoring this event. Um, and Yongbon Koo is the, the leader for this project and one of his colleagues, Samuel. Samuel, are you here? Samuel, down the front. He's involved in this project. If you're interested, you can talk to him afterwards. Uh, they started about a year ago. They um, pinged me for some information on Ross. So I went down to Etri and gave them a seminar and, and basically was a Q&A question for about two or three hours. And uh, they are working on, it's not so much a focus on autonomous cars, I believe, but it's more a focus on assisted driving in, in helping the, the user drive. So corroborating with the driver to, to uh, create a better experience. Um, they introduced ROS mostly for the, the IPC framework. Uh, between all the different modules, they, they already had some parts developed. Uh, I think this is a similar story to the other groups that have talked about it today. They, they have some software already there. They have some groups which they're working with that are already there. There are some things that ROS can't reach out to yet. Uh, so you need to sort of like fill the gaps. And uh, that's what they're using ROS for. And Youngbon really loves the visualization. I think everybody in the ROS world loves the free visualization tools you get. Um, they're also taking Jack's old software from the autonomous project they had at Austin University 
Uh, I think Jack would be really happy to see his code living on somehow. Um, and just to sum up what they're doing, they uh, again, I think it's a message we all understand. It's great for prototyping, great for rapidly putting to get to other things for for debugging, for visualizing, um, and for logging. Uh, the things, and so they're really committed to it now, which is great. Uh, the things that's lacking, uh, obviously, the the connection, the glue to other components, and I think that's a topic that's coming up more and more in Ross over the last year or so. Um, and the documentation, and for them, this is this is hard. The documentation, they they have to read 100% English. I think it's like the converse problem. Um, and that's one of the things that's holding it back in Korea in a big way. Uh, the programmers realize that they really need to understand English to sort of go international and accelerate what they do, but so many of them actually don't have that good English or they're nervous about it. Uh, in the same way, I'm extremely nervous talking to my Korean dad in Korean. Um, and uh, yeah, I think also in documentation, one thing we need to do, it's, it's kind of, I, I wouldn't say slipping, but it's not as good as it was uh, two or three years ago, and I think that's just uh, the versions keep progressing and progressing and progressing, and some of the documentation gets mixed up. You don't, uh, some of it's a little bit old or out of date. Uh, they did some work recently to overhaul the ROS wiki so you could uh, manage the versions a bit better. Um, but usually the people doing the documentation are, uh, is like the core developer and nobody else around that commits much effort to it. Uh, so. Another problem with being a core developer writing documentation documentation too, it's all in your head. And so it's you write something and sometimes it's not very compatible to a guy who comes along trying to use your software as well. So uh, so if you, you have something you use and you do become a semi-expert at it, do help try and improve the documentation on the wiki. It would be great for everyone. Thank you. <laughs>